I'm Afshin Ratansi. This is Going Underground, trying to answer the questions not asked by mainstream media every Monday, Wednesday and Saturday. Coming up on the show is Assad winning. We speak to Charles Glass, award-winning foreign correspondent who spent his career on the ground in the Middle East about the turning tide in Syria. And after this week's Syria ceasefire talks between Russia, Turkey and Iran, we talk to Amnesty International about the timing of their allegations against President Assad's government. Plus, how enduring are the myths created by mainstream media about Britain's military catastrophes in Iraq, Libya and Syria? And... It's a discourtesy to the House of Commons. Was the Speaker of the House of Commons again talking about Trump's state visit? All this and more coming up in today's Going Underground, but first... Top of the agenda at meetings today between US President Donald Trump and Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe in Florida will likely be China. Trump looks set to continue Obama's policy of laying siege to the People's Republic with US bases. It's something that former Japanese Prime Minister Yukio Hatoyama says in the case of expansion at Hinoko on Okinawa Island will not lead to anything good. It is obvious that stationing the U.S. military base in Hanoko is a big mistake that will lead to a bloody tragedy in the country. But any need for possible military action against any perceived threat from China is arguably not felt so keenly here in Britain. In fact, the Chinese Communist Party, together with the French government, is behind one of Britain's biggest infrastructure projects, Hinkley Sea Nuclear Power Station in southwestern England. The EPR, or European Pressurized Water Reactor, is the most powerful and safest nuclear reactor in the world. As of today, EDF is committed to building five units. Yes, on that map is a nuclear reactor in Britain that will cost the UK taxpayer billions, based on the design of another reactor in France, Flammerville. You may have heard the name of that town mentioned in the news this week. An explosion at a French nuclear power plant Thursday, but officials say there is no risk of a radiation leak. Few, in fact, if we assume the world is no longer threatened by terrorism, the public should be assured that nuclear reactors are the safest form of power. Japanese authorities, immediately after the 2011 Fukushima plant explosion, said there was no immediate threat to the public. But look what happened in just the past few days, five years after the disaster. Radiation levels inside a Fukushima nuclear power plant damaged by that tsunami nearly six years ago is now at their highest point since that disaster. And experts believe melted fuel is leaking inside the plant almost daily, causing radiation levels high enough to kill a human being with just brief exposure. EDF says everything is now fine in Flammaville. This week, Russia, Turkey and Iran held peace talks in the Kazakhstan capital of Astana to put an end, or at least try to put an end, to six years of Syrian civil war that has led to millions being killed, displaced or wounded. Mainstream media has been decidedly quiet on the ceasefire talks, but Theresa May did sneak out an announcement that the UK is to dash the hopes of any of the thousands of Syrian child refugees still harboring desires to come to Britain for safety. Award-winning author and journalist Charles Glass, who has just been in Syria, joins me now. Charles, thanks so much for coming back on uh, the Atlantic Council. Council, this neocon organization on Monday is going to be issuing a big report about uh, the failure uh, in terms of regime change in Syria. How did they fail? The attempt to dispose of the Syrian regime, which was done um, at arm's length by providing weapons, logistical support to more than a thousand rebel groups, was never likely to succeed in the first place. All that it was likely to do was ravage Syria in terms you've just described, with the many people who have been killed and wounded and have been, had, have been forced out of their homes, maybe a third of the population homeless. Uh, the, the prospect for the success of getting rid of the regime was minimal to begin with. The regime is very strong. The security services are ruthless and thorough. Uh, the army did not crack as the United States had hoped it would. Uh, the rebels were counting on NATO support of the kind that uh, the rebels in Libya received against Gaddafi with Arab airstrikes, that didn't materialize. It was never promised, by the way, so the rebels were, were actually beginning their rebellion um, on a misunderstanding that they would, they would get that kind of support. So the, I, I would say that the rebellion was doomed from day one, but all that could happen while the rebellion was going on, and it is still going on, is that the country slowly degrades. Syria was on our TV screens every single day up until when Donald Trump was elected, apart from an Amnesty International report, we're going to speak to them later in the program. How did, it, when Trump was elected, how did Syria just disappear suddenly as an issue? 
Well, I think Trump's antics in the, since he moved into the White House have, have mesmerized uh, the, the world. I mean, not just the media, but the public as well. And he's, he's, not, he's taken away um, attention that, from, from not only from Syria, but from just about everything. Um, I th and, uh, and also, we don't, because the United States now doesn't have a policy on Syria. Obama had a, a half-hearted policy on Syria and a, and, a, and a contradictory policy on Syria. Trump has no policy on Syria, and he hasn't put it on his agenda. And a lot of the American press depends on uh, the agenda from Washington for, its, for what it will report. And at the moment, Syria is taking a back seat. In fact, there's a lot that's going on in Syria now, very interesting developments, the peace, the peace talks, uh, the, the um, surrender of Aleppo, the surrender of neighborhoods around Damascus, uh, where things are moving in the direction of, of a regime victory, uh, which is certainly worth knowing about if you're going to follow the, the story. And also, as, as larger areas of Syria become pacified, more Syrians will be able to go home. How do you think the British government views all of this, especially statements like that coming from President Assad saying that working with Trump looks set to be positive? Well, I think if, if, if Assad did say that, that he means that his relations with Washington under Obama, and particularly under when, when Hillary Clinton was Secretary of State, were abysmal, and they were calling for his immediate removal, that they were even making it a precondition of talks at the beginning. Theresa May did as well. And, and that those, those things, because they could, never, they could never actually get him to agree to resign, they didn't have the power to do that. Uh, delayed talks and kept and, and allowed the war to accelerate. Now, with Trump coming in, his good relationship, his apparently better relationship with Russia, where Russia has the upper hand in Syria, would imply that he's going to accept, as the British Foreign Secretary seems to have accepted, that Assad isn't going, and uh, and the tra transition period, such as it is, may be a transition back to him. So, how, how do you characterize Trump's? anti-Saudi policy on Syria, as it were, and yet it's kind of pro-Saudi policy on Yemen and kind of Iran. Well, Russia's not active in Yemen. Um, Russia's been active in Syria. I mean, Russia's only ally in the Arab world is Syria, and, and, it's, and it's been an important asset to the Russians. Although and Vladimir Putin was in Egypt, of course. Uh, he was, but, a gun but, but the relationship with Egypt after Sadat expelled the Russian advisors uh, was, was never good. I mean, they might have had personal relationships, but the, the, they went from the Soviet camp to the American camp and have not left the American camp. Syria never did that. Syria was in the Soviet camp. It stayed in the Russian camp. And Yemen is not part of that Russian-American conflict in the region. It's part of a Saudi-Iranian conflict in the region. And, that, and, and Trump is extremely anti-Iranian, as, as Obama was. Even though they're allied to Iran on the Syria policy? I wouldn't say allied. I would say that they, they have a... They have common interests, but their their interpretation of strategy has been has been somewhat different. The Russians have been much more in favor of the reconciliation programs, uh, whereby rebel groups surrender and and uh, give up their arms and are not arrested, uh, than than the Iranians. The Iranians have been pretty much opposed to that. They they would like to see an all-out military victory, um, but they you know they're on the same side for the time being. But I, I don't think that that will be permanent. How is this reconciliation system working? I know you spoke to President Assad, spoke to us in Bethana when Bethana Shaban when you were in Damascus. Well, it seems from the regime point of view to be working very well. I mean, in neighborhoods where uh, people are under siege, and, they, and the people want to eat and to have water and to have be able to live properly, they put pressure on the rebels to go so that they they can have peace again because they know that they're they're cut off from the supplies in Turkey. In Idlib province, for example, where the supply line to Turkey is still open for the rebels. They don't have to surrender. They don't have to be involved in reconciliation. They think that they can go on fighting. But in areas around the suburbs of Damascus, it's the opposite. They're cut off from supplies, and people want an end to the conflict. I went to, I went to some of those neighborhoods and to, and to the uh, displaced persons camps where many of the people from Daraya and Wadamiya and some of the other suburbs have gone, and they are relieved just not to have bombs falling on them, just to have running water again, just to have food to feed their children, and, to, and for the children to be able to go to school again. This has all become much more important to them than any hope of changing the regime. Theresa May's announcement sneaked out this week that, uh, I mean, they're presumably not going to use your piece as evidence that all is fine and well and happy, in, uh, and, you, and you make clear it isn't in your latest piece, I must say. What do you think about not letting in thousands of uh, Syrian child refugees into Britain? I think not letting in child refugees from anywhere is a disgrace. These, these people, these are children. They've done no harm to anyone, and they're not going to terrorize this, this country. 
there's no history of children any from coming from anywhere, whether it was the kinder transports in, in, in before the Second World War or, or the, the child refugees from Hungary in 56. These people became good citizens, and so will, the, so will these young Syrians. Or if they're even here temporarily until their families are reunited and they can go back home, it's, it's, it's vital to give them shelter and to give them hope. And also Britain and America and France by their support of the rebels and by their encouraging a violent solution in Syria, helped, our, helped to create this refugee problem, helped to make these people homeless. So there's an obligation to help them. Charles Glass, thank you. Britain's National Health Service is in crisis, according to many British politicians. And at this week's PMQs, Labour leader Jeremy Corbyn again raised the issue of a UK healthcare system funded at half the budget accorded to Donald Trump's US healthcare system as a proportion of GDP. Corbyn started on accident and emergency, or A&E, which is in the front line. People had to wait up to 13 hours and 52 minutes to be seen. A major cause of the pressure on A&Es is the 4.6 billion cut in the social care budget since 2010. Adult social care cuts followed the mass bank bailouts, which means that the elderly in Britain now go to emergency departments instead of being cared for in the community. But as usual, Corbyn did not raise bank bailouts, and he leads a parliamentary party intricately to blame for the 2008 crisis. Not only that, but Corbyn's Labour Party is in charge of health services in Wales, a rump neoliberal Labour Party that, according to the Prime Minister, is failing miserably. Waiting times can be an issue. Where is it that you wait a week longer for pneumonia treatment? That you wake, uh, wait a week longer for heart disease treatment? That you wait seven weeks longer for cataract treatment? Eleven weeks longer for hernia treatment? And 21 weeks longer for a hip operation? It's not in England, it's in Wales. Who's in power in Wales? Labour. And Corbyn is not disavowing the neoliberals on his own backbenches, let alone at the Welsh Assembly. So no matter what he had to say about leaked information suggesting preferential health care for areas in Britain electing people from Theresa May's Conservative Party, he lost again. Not only with an entire mainstream media that's as against him as Donald Trump, but arguably those who voted for him to be leader as well. After the break. Headlines from around the world on Amnesty International's allegations against the Syrian government. But why did Amnesty choose this week to accuse Damascus of war crimes? We speak to the co-author of that controversial report. And unlike Iraq and Libya, why did propaganda in NATO nations, this time around, fail to catalyze British bombing of Damascus? All this and more coming up in part two of Going Underground. Welcome back. Amnesty International this week made headlines around the world for its new report alleging that the Syrian government has sanctioned mass killings and torture. Philip Luther, co-author of the report titled Human Slaughterhouse, Mass Hangings and Extermination at Sidnaya Prison in Syria, joins me now. Philip, welcome to Going Underground. So what's Amnesty International discovered about uh, mass killing in Syria? Well, our report has revealed that from 2011, uh, the Syrian authorities within a prison on the outskirts of Damascus have engaged in mass killings, uh, mass executions by hanging of what is between 5,000 and 13,000 people, according at least to our calculations. And they've done that by taking people out of their cells, groups of 20 to 50 people at a time, uh, once or twice a week, according to the information we have, and often taken them then to another, uh, to, to a basement in the same in the same prison, then to another building uh, where they they think they're going to be taken to a civilian prison. They have their hopes high because of that. They think they're going to be taken out of this military prison, but then they're subjected to a one to two minute procedure. It's not a trial, just really a death registration procedure. They have their eyes uh, uh, blindfolded throughout this uh, throughout this time and then the noose is put around their neck. And, 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 and these mass hangings have been occurring then since 2011, we believe. Reminiscent of massacres like the Hamo massacre carried out by President Assad's father, by, uh, the Lion of Damascus? Well, I mean, in terms of the shocking numbers, yes. In terms of the method, no. I mean, here we're talking about uh, you know, mass hangings that are carried out. I mean, the Syrian authorities would, I think, say 
that some sort of due process has been... Uh, That's exactly what they say uh, when it comes to the executions they have carried out. Uh, but what, and, and uh, we say this because we've been talking not only to former detainees, we've, we spent a, a year uh, investigating this piece uh, between two th uh, December 2015 to December 2016. And so we talked to former detainees. Um, we talked as well, though, to uh, former prison guards and former prison officials who are at the prison, as well as judges who oversaw saw the process. And it was then putting these testimonies together, they were, they were collected separately, uh, cross-checking the information that we came out then with this report. On this wide range mm. from 5,000 to 13,000, symptomatic of the fact that it's difficult for Amnesty International to get exact figures because you're banned from Syria. Well, it, the, the, the reality is that uh, no one gets into Sydney Prison, as far as we know, in terms of uh, independent monitors of any kind. Uh, so, uh, the may, you know, obviously Amnesty has not been allowed into uh, areas that are controlled by the Syrian government since the start of uh, the crisis in Syria. But uh, access to military prisons is, uh, is, a, is a problem for anyone, uh, whether they be journalists or whether inside the country or, out, or from outside the country. But it, they, they, the, these are calculations based on estimates that those that we have talked to have given us. And so we've talked to people who were in Sydney during different periods over the, uh, since 2011. And so they, you know, the, it wasn't the exact same number of people who were being taken out every week. And so by then looking at all the different uh, testimonies that we have and making a calculation, that is the range that we have given in this report. So uh, no one doubts that uh, a lot of brutality, I think the old tragic joke yes. about truth being the first casualty of war. Yes. Any fears that the timing of Amnesty International's report, your report, mm. could endanger the very fragile quasi peace process now happening in Syria. If, if a peace process that was ongoing was a reason not to come out with uh, you know, reports of human rights violations, then we would never do it because of course then there's been a peace process that's been theoretically ongoing for you know, stop start with different people yeah, at right the helm. Now, right now I think the international but I don't see in what way this in any way endangers the, the peace process. I mean, the point about the, the and, and, you know, if any peace process is to be durable, if it's to be sustainable, it has to have human rights at its heart. And that's been, you know, the fundamental problem with so many peace processes around the world. I mean, the classic one, of course, it's a totally different issue, of course, is the Israeli-Palestinian one. Human rights have been absent from the agenda there. And look how quickly that issue has been resolved. Yeah, but it was again and again, Amnesty International issued reports just before the Iraq war against Saddam Hussein, just before the NATO bombing of Libya, just before the NATO intervention in Afghanistan, just... Uh... And just after as well. No, I mean, I mean the point is, if you, you, of course, we're issuing reports the whole time. So, uh, the, for me, that argument doesn't, doesn't stack up. I mean, we, we've, we've come to the conclusion of our investigation. We feel, actually, the timing of the report uh, corresponds to that. But also, and this is really important in our view, I mean, there are other dynamics at international level going on. I mean, one of those is, and the Security Council has been completely blocked uh, in terms of Syria over, over the it's last six years. It's not been blocked at all. <laughs> They've all agreed. It has been blocked process. when, no, it has been blocked when it comes to international justice. No, wait, wait, wait. No, no, no. It's and just, this is, this no, is, no, this is really important. It's been blocked about a no-fly zone. No, it's been really, it's been blocked as when it comes to international justice. The, what, the, what we think the Security Council should have done is refer the situation in Syria to the International Criminal Court. Um, I mean, that, given the scale of violations, we're talking about violations by different... The United different, States is not a member of. Well, they should, yeah, well of course. I mean, that's, that's, that's a major problem in itself. That doesn't stop the Security Council referring the situation in Syria to the International Criminal Court. It's not about the United States. The United States is not, should not be an arbiter of justice here. It's about the International Criminal Court doing its work to look into violations committed by the different parties to the conflict in Syria. That's been blocked. However, what did happen at the end of the last year was the UN General Assembly created a mechanism that uh, it would, should facilitate investigations into the worst violations committed in okay, Syria. Let's, let's cut to the, to the chase. Amnesty International USA appointed Hillary Clinton's assistant for international organization affairs as the head of Amnesty International USA. If Hillary Clinton was president of the United States, of course, there would be a no-fly zone and full-scale bombing okay. campaign in Syria. Wait, wait, wait this that has got nothing to do with... Sorry, sorry, that's got nothing to do... I mean, I'm sorry, this is, that's completely off-topic, if, if you don't mind me saying. I mean, my point is about international justice. There's an opportunity for international justice here because of what was set up with the UN General Assembly. That mechanism should be, should be working, and it's in its nascent stage at the moment, with the commission inquiry that was set up by the UN Human Rights Council to do something about crimes that have been committed by whatever side. 
Uh, and, but before all of that, and this could be part of the peace process, frankly, independent monitors should be allowed into prisons. Uh, I mean, there was a very interesting statement by the head of the, the Senate Foreign Affairs Committee in Russia, for instance, who, while you know, criticizing the report that Amnesty uh, launched, did say that it, he was calling on the Syrian government to uh, make access to prisons um, more public. And, you know, and that Amnesty shouldn't be the final word on this. And we, we completely agree. I mean, Amnesty shouldn't be the final word on this. This, we feel, is a very important uh, document. However, there should be an investigation that is conducted internationally that, that, that complements other investigations to get to the bottom of what's going on, to see if some of the same practices are happening in other prisons. And at the end of the day, to ensure that it doesn't happen again. And just very briefly, do you call on uh, the Syrian government, Russia, Iran, China, de facto the United States yes. now backing the Syrian government mm. against ISIS in Syria to do just that? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and you know, uh, there's been a, you know, you, you mentioned the, the, the US and obviously there's a, a lot of talk about a, uh, what is now a, a concerted approach towards uh, Islamic State and, and that being the priority. With the Syrian government. With, with the Syrian government. But if, if that is to be taken serious and you have a serious strategy on that, which is not, and you know, we all know that mi a military strategy alone is not going to resolve that issue, uh, then you've got to do something about reports of mass violations, what we're terming crimes against humanity that have been committed by the Syrian government. Philip Luther, thank you. Thank you very much. Well, we just heard from Amnesty International. Some have suspected, though, that an entire intelligence propaganda system has long had designs on regime change in Syria and other countries, including our next guest. He's the author of the Handbook of Media Conflict and Security, and he's Professor of Politics, Society and Political Journalism at the University of Sheffield in Britain. Professor Pierce Robinson, welcome to Going Underground. So, uh, any reasons to suspect NGOs of uh, having suspect timing when it comes to reports on human rights? Well, I don't want to be drawn into commenting on, on, on any specific report which has just come out. However, I do think it's very important to recognize that the conflict in Syria and really most of the major conflicts which have been occurring over the last 15 years have been accompanied by and been associated with very major and very substantial propaganda campaigns, attempts to try and persuade and manipulate opinion to support conflicts. And we saw that very clearly in the case of Iraq. Now, given the knowledge that we have that that's occurring, it then becomes an absolutely imperative to treat all sources of information information with scrutiny and to question what we're being told. And that does include information which might be coming from organizations such as Amnesty International. Because in, in conflicts of this scale and with propaganda campaigns as extensive as, as the ones we've seen in recent years, organizations such as these can sometimes get caught up in, in, in these activities. So it's very, very important to, to, to use your own intelligence and to use your own judgment and, and to question and to scrutinize information, especially, especially information which emerges at, at, as you suggest, at critical points, at critical stages in a conflict. How quickly do you think myths become part of the uh, international political discourse? I mean, Paul Mason, a former journalist with Channel 4 here in the UK, apparently advising Jeremy Corbyn informally, says President Obama stood aloof from the Syria conflict. Uh, that seems to be a general view, that uh, Syria would have been better if President Obama had been more engaged. Well, this is, this is one of the big, as it were, successes of the, the PR, propaganda, strategic communication campaign, call it what you will. And one of the great successes from, from the point of view of Western governments has been a representation of the conflict as something which is entirely internal to Syria without any involvement of the West. Um, and these myths do get established and they do become perpetuated and they come to be believed. And even when you have ample amounts of evidence in the public domain, which shows that, that the West has, has never been standing aside from the conflict in, in, in Syria. In fact, there's a, there's a long history running all the way back to uh, the immediate aftermath of 9-11, where you see conversations going on uh, regarding Syria and the possibility of attacking Syria. And are these democratic forces? I mean, if the BBC, Amnesty, CNN, mainstream media are all de facto part of this, then what will be the pressure on, say, President Donald Trump if he wants to change his policy on Syria in the context of 
uh, regime change which you implied there amongst different countries? I do think that uh, quite clearly that there's a continuity and a consistency of policies over the last 15 years which point towards a geostrategic strategy aimed at um, both taking out countries who are opposed or who do not operate according to our perception of our interests or pushing cajoling countries. And this has been clear uh, from well, from the conflicts we've seen, but it's also been evidenced by now the Chilcot Report, Section 3.1 of the Chilcot Report, which uh, makes very clear that there was a phase one and phase two of the war on terror, and also confirmed by people such as uh, General Wesley Clark, who made very clear in 2006 that he was aware of a, a geostrategic strategy aimed at taking out countries and so on. And, and, and that does point towards um, you know, whoever's in power, et cetera, that there's, there's sort of other forces at work in, in that sense of a, of, of, of a strategy being pursued over time. Whether Trump takes it in a different direction, uh, well, we'll have to wait and see. You are an expert on propaganda, but it has to be said that uh, despite what we heard about Syria from NGOs, from media, the RAF never did bomb, say, the mosque in Damascus or, or whatever. Do you think after the failure of Libya, despite all the propaganda, uh, the, the propaganda fails basically now? Well, in some ways, the truth comes out ultimately, but sometimes it comes out after, after the event. Um, after the hundreds of thousands have died. Yes, and after the, the, the policy has been achieved or it's gone wrong, etc. Um, and I'm, you know, I, I'm not sure what good that does. However, having said that, I think some myths you, that you refer to these things as myths, some of these myths do in fact persist for long periods of time um, and don't necessarily come to light. I suspect at this point in time, given the kind of political crisis that we have in the West and given the information environment that we have today in terms of alternative media, I suspect that these things will come to be known perhaps more quickly than they have done in the past. Um, but again, uh, we're in a very fast changing environment, political and also media environment at the moment. Um, and the struggle, the struggle for hearts and minds, the struggle for perceptions, etc., and the manipulation associated with that um, is in full flow at the moment and quite where it's going to end up is anybody's guess. And just finally, when you criticise or analyse propaganda, what are you supposed to do when you, just for analysing it, immediately get accused of being pro-Assad, pro-Trump, who knows, pro-Corbyn? Well, you, you just have to, you know, engage in rational argumentation that simply because uh, you explain that the West is involved in a particular strategy does not logically mean that you're then supporting the opposition. That's just falling into a very simplistic trap. It's the kind of the sort of discursive trick which George Bush, uh, W. Bush played after 9-11. Kind of, you're either with us or against this sort of logic and, and mentality. Um, really, uh, you can, you know, you can be critical of, for example, Assad or Putin and critical of those governments and what they do, and also be critical of your own government at the same time. This is not a matter of taking sides between governments. It's a matter of, of telling the truth. Professor Pierce Robinson, thank you. And that's it for today. We'll be back on Monday when we speak to the Palestinian ambassador to Britain about whether Trump is really such a good friend of Israel. In the meantime, get in touch with our social media. We'll see you on Monday. 384 years to the day Galileo was brought before the Roman Catholic Inquisition.